Hello and welcome to Atlantic Conversations. I'm Fanula Sweeney. The Atlantic Fellowship Programme works with a diverse community of leaders around the world with a common commitment to fairer, healthier, more inclusive societies. Through its seven programmes focused on equity and healthcare, socio-economic equity and racial equity, the Atlantic Fellowships offer those leaders an opportunity to gain new perspectives and new colleagues, while strengthening their confidence in their work for change. In each podcast, I'll be speaking to an Atlantic Fellow about their work and ambitions for a more just world. In this podcast, I'm joined by Sarah Hooper. Sarah is Executive Director of the UCSF UC Hastings Consortium on Law, Science and Health Policy. She's also Adjunct Professor of Law at UC Hastings College of the Law. Sarah is a graduate of the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity US and Global Program at George Washington University. I asked her what had attracted her to the law, particularly social justice law. I've always been drawn to politics and social justice and law is one of our key mechanisms for organizing ourselves as society. So law is both a process and the decisions that we make as a society about what we think we owe one another and what we think is fair. Now, you're based in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. San Francisco is seen to be a society in the state of California which looks after people and their health needs better than other states, perhaps, in the United States. But for you, it's clearly not enough. Largely, yes. I mean, California is known as a very progressive state, and San Francisco is one of the most progressive cities in the United States. But over the years, we have seen growing disparities in the United States. California is certainly home to very large disparities, and San Francisco is certainly home to many disparities in wealth and income. So how do you, from your vantage point of being a lawyer, go about changing equity for people of different backgrounds, different means, different outlooks, so that there is some health equity in their lives? I think you can tell a lot about a society by our law. Because, as I said, the law is the way that we decide what we owe to one another and how we distribute our resources to one another and how we resolve disputes. And so you can look at a place's law and say, who plays by the rules, who writes the rules, and who gets played by the rules. And so I think a society's process for organizing itself is really important. So the law is really about how we treat each other and how we organize with one another. Do you think every lawyer sees it that way? I teach law students, and I think that a lot of students are drawn to law school out of a sense of social justice. When I talk to new law students about equity and justice, their eyes light up. And when I talk to them about contracts and business associations, their eyes kind of dull. I think a lot of us go to law school for notions of social justice and making the world a better place. I think the realities of legal practice They're actually very similar to medicine. They don't drive us in the direction of the legal equivalent of family medicine or primary care. They incentivize us and they drive us in the direction of corporate practice. So we have a civil justice gap in the United States, which basically means that if you have means or you're a business, you have access to legal help. But for the rest of us, even the middle class, there's a huge gap in access to civil legal resources. And how does that play out then in the consciousness of Americans in terms of how they view people who have less access to health care, etc.? In the space of healthcare, we talk a lot about the role of health literacy in someone's ability to be healthy. As a lawyer, I think a lot about rights literacy or legal literacy, our ability to understand what our rights are with respect to one another. Our rights are to our own housing, to income, to public benefits, to the social determinants of health. Um, Which vary for people. Which vary for people. Different people have different needs. But our ability to resolve our own problems and understand our tools and rights with respect to those problems, that is a form of literacy that's very important, but I think underlooked. And if it's underlooked, then what does it lead people to think or form a view about those who might be less successful in their lives and ultimately less successful in their access to healthcare, for example? 
Well, in the United States, we have a very strong view that if you are disadvantaged in this society, it's because of something that you have done wrong or some choice that you've not made for and yourself. So how much has that view then fed into the social determinants and the lack of health equity? I think for generations, we've told ourselves that we can ignore the sick and the poor because they are sick and they are poor because they have decided to be, or they have failed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, or they have failed to live their lives and make choices in a way that makes them healthy or gives them wealth. But I think that what we know through the social determinants literature is that our environments in many ways are chosen for us in the larger sense by collective decisions we make as a society. So the policies that we make about how we distribute resources, how do we plan communities, urban development. In the United States, we have this really horrific history of redlining, which is a process by which African Americans were denied mortgages in certain communities for overtly discriminatory reasons. So systematic ways of keeping certain people from accessing resources because of their skin color or because of their class or for some other reason. And has that changed? It has changed in its overtness. I think there are still subtle ways in which, for instance, in employment discrimination, so gender, race, mental health, disability bias, still pervade employment decisions and access to education. We still segregate ourselves by neighborhood in the United States. Um, so if you come from a certain zip code, that will affect the school your children go to, state absolutely. schools, and then that begins to feed into the social determinants that will determine your life. Absolutely. So you would argue, presumably, that the man on the street with no home, no access to health care, has the same right to age with dignity as someone who is extremely comfortable or even just comfortable. He has the same right as a human, but his ability to access that human right is determined in large part by how his more immediate society, his county government, his city government, his state government, his federal government, chooses to realize and put the conditions in place so that he can actually realize that right. And presumably that also falls down on the individual within communities who don't see people who are perhaps less well, literally, (laughs) healthily, as they are as neighbors. The sense of community must play a very strong role, one suspects, in fostering a sense of health equity. Yeah, I think that in a democratic society where we, at least in theory, all have the opportunity to inform how our society is governed and how we distribute resources, we collectively make decisions. But that also does still mean that as individuals, we have a responsibility to see what is happening to our neighbors and to say, we can do better. And how do you, from your perspective, actually go about that, changing that? Is it on an individual level? Is it a community level? And is it always through the law? As a lawyer, that's my primary lens. And so what we do in our program is primarily at the individual level. So legal aid lawyers are lawyers who practice something called poverty law. And so those are lawyers who specialize in helping the poor get access, kind of maximize their housing. So enforcing housing laws, enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act, helping advocate for them to get access to public benefits, to increase economic security. And where does the resistance to that come from, may I ask? It comes from two places. The first is there is a set of people who I think for ideological reasons think that it's not the state's place to provide these kind of supports for individuals. And you would argue that it is? I believe that it is. I think there's another place that's a little bit less ideological and more pragmatic, which is we can't possibly afford to provide these resources to everybody. So we shouldn't try or we should have them very restricted. And again, presumably, you would argue that's not the case. I think it's more nuanced than that. And I think that we have very good studies that show that caregiving is not actually free, that there's actually a huge economic impact when families aren't able to be in the workforce or get education because they're providing care for a loved one, an older adult or even children. So I think that we have to look at cost in a much broader way, in a much more nuanced way, and think more carefully about what costs matter to us. In my program... We've done a lot of thinking about 
How is it that we are paying for things through the healthcare system that other countries pay for through their social service systems? So the United States, when you look at our social spending relative to our health spending, we have very, very high health spending and relatively low social spending. One of the theories is that our health spending is so high because our social spending is so low, that we are simply paying for things through the emergency room that other countries pay for in better economic supports and access to care. And to the uninitiated, why is that? Well, if you think about somebody who doesn't have access to primary care, they didn't have a good job, they don't have good social networks, they might delay care... They just have a higher burden of illness. So they're in the hospital regularly, going to the ER regularly. Yeah. The classic example that we use in the medical legal partnership world is the family with the child with asthma who keeps coming back to the hospital and the medical interventions don't seem to be making a difference, but it turns out their home is infested with mold. So what a lawyer would do is go in and negotiate with the landlord to abate the mold. So if we move forward... You're an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity. You've just graduated. Where does this take you? What has it meant to you to be an Atlantic Fellow? Has it met your expectations? What does it give you in terms of the tools or perhaps resources to continue the work you're already doing? It's been an amazing experience. And I think it has given me a community of people who are like-minded in the sense that we see that The social determinants of health are not determinative, that these are choices and we all have the power to change them. And so I'm actually really excited about what this community can do together from all of our disciplines around the world, our various perspectives and experience. And I think it's made me realize that leadership is really community organizing and that one of the most important things we can do as leaders is to listen and to work with our colleagues across disciplines and in the community and make sure that we're organizing each other to come together and reach our common aim, which perhaps sounds Pollyannish, but I actually genuinely believe that that kind of organizing can make change possible. Well, Sarah Hooper, Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Sarah Hooper, Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity, For more information, you can visit www.atlanticfellows.org. I'm Fanula Sweeney, and you've been listening to the Atlantic Conversations podcast.